Holy Spirit that inspired it. I pray today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will inspire our hearts and help us to see what you would have us to see, hear what you would have us to hear, receive the fullness of all that you would have us to receive today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, whether it be through me or in spite of me, if necessary. Amen. Amen. 1 Samuel 18, beginning with verse 1. It says, As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, David, King David, who would become King David, the soul of Jonathan, this is the son of King Saul, was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house, David. Then David, or then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, this morning. Thanks, Thanks be to God. There is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship according to uh, one of the great Western philosophers and theologians and thinkers from a long time ago, Thomas Aquinas. There is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. Now what is it that makes a person a true friend? What is it to be a true friend? Now you can look up the dictionary definition of friend, uh, and I think it would give you a good idea. But I found some things this week that really I kind of, I think, bring it out, what makes a good friend. One little proverb, a modern day proverb I found was, it's someone who makes you laugh a little louder, smile a little bigger, and live a little better. Someone who makes you laugh a little louder, smile a little bigger, and live a little better. Someone that gets you excited to be in their presence. It makes you happy and blessed to be in their presence. That maybe even gets you, you know, kind of buzzing on the inside. I see this uh, with my dog when I come home from a trip. You know, my dog's a man's best friend, right? Uh, the uh, marriage counselor, Gary Smalley, I think he's passed away now, but a long-time servant of the Lord, Gary Smalley, told this story about he was in a counseling session and... Uh, there was a couple at odds with one another, and the, the husband was, you know, uh, really uh, coming home every day, his wife said, and the first thing he would do, she was so upset, she said, the first thing he'll do is he'll go straight to that dog before he'll say a word to me. And Gary thought about this for a little while, and he said, hmm, how does the dog greet him when he comes home compared to how you greet him? <laughs> When he comes home. Now, I know my dog Cooper, when I get home from somewhere, Cooper is happy to see us. He is, and not only is his tail wagging, some people that come to visit us, they say, I think your dog smiled at me. That's weird, man. Your dog is smiling. I mean, his whole body just gets all wound up and buzzing on the inside, and he's excited. And not only is his tail wagging, his whole back end is moving like this, and he's kind of going sideways, and he's just so excited to see you. Makes me think of Ian when he was in the Cub Scouts. The kids, when they get there for the Cub Scout meeting, they get out of the car, the parents let them out of the car, and all of a sudden they go, zoom! They're all there around each other. You can see them, they're just kind of running around each other and just so excited to see each other. They have fun together. That's someone that is a friend. Someone that you can have fun with. Someone you enjoy being around. Someone who brings a little bit of more brightness into your life, a little more buzz, if you will, uh, in a good way, into your life. But a friend is also someone, another little proverb I found, someone who, uh, who can hear you, not only when you're fun and having an exciting time, and you know, you're laughing together and cutting up together, but someone who can hear you when you're not saying anything. 
Someone who can hear you when you're quiet. I remember a time where I was a teenager, I was about 17 maybe, and uh, I was dating this girl, and I was really, really excited about this girl, but come to find out, she wasn't as quite as excited about me as I was about her, and she decided she didn't want to be with me anymore, and I was depressed. I was sad. And I have a friend, his name is Dwayne Joyce. Dwayne, for however he knew it, I don't know how he knew it, he heard somehow, whatever, he knew he needed to be there for me. I didn't say a word to him, but he knew he needed to be there for me. So he came to see me, and he took me out to eat. And just being in his presence made me feel a lot better. But he could hear me even though I wasn't saying anything. That's a true friend, someone who knows you well enough to know what you're saying when you're not saying anything. A true friend are people who are true friends are people who are there for you in good times and they're there for you in bad times. And your true friends are revealed most clearly to you and to me in the bad times. No doubt about it. That's where we see true friends in our times of adversity. Another way to describe someone who is a friend is someone who uh, they know you're crazy and they still choose to be with you in public anyway. <laughs> you know that's a true friend. When they know how crazy you are, they know your faults, they know your shortcomings, they know your picadillos, they know your little issues, and you know some of us have more than issues. Or one preacher say one time, some of us have whole subscriptions of problems, not just issues. But a true friend is a person who will be there for you and with you, even when other people think you're a little bit nuts. Now, if you're a true Christian person, if you're really living for the Lord, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to think you're pretty crazy. I found out in the last few years for really taking a stand for just basic Christian morality and what's right, I really found out who true friends really were. I found out that there were people who would not want to be associated with me for the things that I took a stand for. There were people who would sit with me before, say, an annual conference, for example, who, well, not so much anymore. But then there are those people that they'll be with you and stick with you no matter what. Christian people in this world should be a peculiar people. We should seem a little bit crazy. And a true friend won't disassociate themselves with you just because of your stand for the Lord or whether you're a little, really a little crazy. We all have our quirks and our picadillos and things and issues uh, at all times. So Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times. A friend loves at at all times, in the good times and in the bad. One of the times when I was really going through a hard time, the same friend I was telling you about that came to be with me when my teenage <coughs> girlfriend broke up with me, uh, when Christy and I uh, had Anna, and Anna was in the hospital at the NICU at Forsyth Medical Center, even though it was a miracle, and even though things uh, turned out very, very well, it was really touch and go day by day for at least two solid weeks. And we were driving back and forth, 35, 40 minute drive back and forth from Pinnacle to Winston and back to Pinnacle every single day. And I wasn't able to get to work and there was a lot going on. And, and this friend, he knew what was going on without me even saying a word. He had gotten together with a Sunday school class and they came up with a love offering. And out of the blue, without anybody asking for any help in this regard at all, he came to me and said, we love you, just want you to know we're there here for you, and he handed me an envelope full of cash. And it came in handy. It came in handy. Friends love at all times, good times and bad times, and that love oftentimes is revealed in the help that they give to us. Now Proverbs 18.24 says that there are friends, there are friends, let's see, let me turn them on. There are friends who destroy each other. Now, there's different ways that this is translated, uh, but the essence of it here is there are friends who hurt each other. So-called friends. It puts friends, the New Living Translation puts friends in quotes here. There are friends who destroy each other. 
But a real friend sticks closer than a brother. A real friend will be like family, or even better than family. A real friend will be there for you in thick or thin, for good times or bad times. They will be there for you to help you and to give you what you need in that time of need and to give you the encouragement that you need. But there are other people who may we may think we're friends, we may think that we have a good relationship because we have good times together, because we have good fun together. And Proverbs here is telling us that this can be really quite dangerous. It can be really dangerous. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's hard for me to even tell you this. I mean, it's a little story that I remember from a, a childhood, and it's hard for me to talk about. It. And it's really, uh, I just get emotional, and my emotions really stay on the inside a lot of times. But I'll never forget the phone call my mother got when I was about four to five years old. And I'll never forget the look of horror on her face and the way she screamed and began to cry when she found out that my Uncle Bill, her brother, had been murdered by a friend. They'd all been out drinking together. They'd all been out having a good time together, partying together, gambling together. And this guy, who was my uncle's friend, one of his close friends, decided that it would be funny to slit his throat. It's horrible, 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 horrible. He woke up the next morning in jail and didn't even remember what he had done. And the, the thing that's even more horrifying about this is that I know that I began to repeat that same pattern of friendship in my own life when I was a teenager and especially the first year or two of college. And there are times where I am very lucky, I'm very blessed by the grace of God I didn't kill anybody else or have anybody else killed or wreck and kill people. Or, or do any major damage myself to other people. So I could have easily been in the place that that guy who found himself in jail the next morning and did not remember what he had done. I know I, that could have easily have been there. But I also could have easily have been my uncle. So that's what Proverbs is getting at. And the eerie thing about this is I was really... Uh, doing some study through what's called the Apocrypha. And these are books that were written between the Old Testament and into the Old Testament, the beginning of the New Testament. And they're, they're not considered by Protestants to be revelation in the sense of the Old Testament and New Testament, but, but they are considered to be helpful and historical. And uh, John Wesley would oftentimes quote from some of these things. But the one of them I remember reading, I can't remember, I think it was the Wisdom of Solomon. I remember reading... Uh, this scenario that it gives where uh, people or friends are drinking together and then one of them ends up hurting another in a really horrible, horrific way and then doesn't even remember what they did. That was written like thousands of years ago and it perfectly described to a T a scenario that happened in my own life and my own family. So there's more to friendship than then just that buzz, if you will, and you can think of that buzz in a little bit different way, I guess, now. But that buzz that you get, that excitement that you get from being around another person. There's more to true friendship than just that buzz. It's more than just laughing a little louder or more than just smiling a little bit better, bigger. But it's also a person who helps you to live. I thought this was wonderful. Live a little better. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. We have the story of David and Jonathan. And David and Jonathan, they had this love for each other, this holy affection for each other. It was an emotional attachment that they had. And their souls were knit together. And Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. And later the Bible makes it clear that David loved Jonathan the same way. Now, I can't tell you how uh, people whose minds cannot get out of the gutter twist this story nowadays. And, and if your kids go to college, they will hear it all. But their love for each other, David would later say after Jonathan dies, their love for each other, his love for uh, David's love, or Jonathan's love for David, he said, David says, your love for me was better than, surpassed the love of women. It means it was better than that, not equal to that, if you know what I mean, okay? So we've got to get our minds out of the gutter in our sick society today. We can't get our minds to think about a love that's better than physical 
sexual intimacy. But they had this love for each other that was so awesome and so wonderful and such a blessing to both of them. And it was based on more than emotion, though. It was based on more than just that emotional attachment that they had for one another. Their love, Jonathan here makes clear, is based on a commitment to each other. Jonathan takes his robe off, and I can't tell you how these perverted people twist this story. He okay, takes his robe, his royal type robe, hands it to David. He takes his, his military equipment and he hands it to David as a way of saying, I am committed to your success. I'm committed to your good. I'm committing myself to you and to your good. And the standard, he made a covenant, the standard was higher than their own self-interest. It was according to the will and to the word of God. Jonathan would eventually catch on that God's will was for David to be king, to replace his own father, Saul. <coughs> and in spite of knowing that he would lose power, he committed himself to the will of God and made a covenant with David. And this covenant relationship, which really cemented and pulled together the emotional attachment that they had for each other, and put it on solid and firm ground is what brought them together in a way that they would commit themselves to each other and for each other's good no matter what. But according to a higher standard. So there were times where Saul became jealous because he knew that King David or David who would become king was uh, going to take his position and Saul would try to have him killed. And there are times where even standing against his father Jonathan would do whatever he could to protect David. And even when he had to confront his father for his evil heart and for the wicked things that he was doing, he did not renege on his commitment to David and David's good and David's blessing. They had a wonderful, wonderful blessed relationship that was grounded in a covenant commitment to each other. Wonderful emotion, but a covenant commitment to each other. And no doubt Jonathan helped David to live a little bit better. David uh, would eventually uh, mourn over the loss of Saul. And David really showed a lot of commitment to Saul, even though Saul was trying to kill him. But the, the thing about the relationship here with Jonathan is Jonathan did help David to live a little bit better in a lot of ways. But later on, after Jonathan has died tragically, and David has been king for a long time, he had another really good friend. Another wonderful friend. See, there was a day where David went out onto a rooftop, just like any other ordinary day. He went out onto a rooftop, and it was a day just simply walking out on the roof and looking down upon the other roofs that would change his life forever. He looked down on a rooftop, and he saw a woman, a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. And knowing exactly what he was doing and knowing exactly that it was wrong, he chose to engage in an adulterous relationship with another man's wife. And this other man happened to be a man named Uriah. And Uriah was one of David's sergeants, if you will. He was a soldier in David's army. He was one of his most faithful soldiers in David's army. And David took this man's wife and he had an adulterous affair with her and she ended up getting pregnant. Now, David realized that he needed to cover his tracks if he was going to hide the mess that he had created. So he has Uriah come home from battle. And he tries to get Uriah to go and spend time, just simply spend time with his wife Bathsheba so he can make it look like it was actually Uriah that has gotten his wife pregnant rather than him. He's trying to cover it up. The cover-up's always usually worse than the actual crime. In this case, it gets really, really bad. Really bad. Not only is David trying to cover it up, but because he can't get Uriah to go home, he just does everything he can, but he can't get Uriah to go home, he writes a note to one of his generals in the field, Joab, and he writes a note saying, make sure Uriah gets killed in the battle. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means, but that is premeditated murder. And if that's not bad enough, David got so desperate that he handed the note to guess who to take to Job? Uriah. He handed Uriah his own death warrant. 
to take to Joab and was going to have himself killed. That's pretty low. That's pretty despicable. Now, if you thought the Bible was boring, you have not been paying attention. You haven't been paying attention. And Uriah was killed. Well, there was a man named Nathan. He caught wind of what was going on, and God told him to go confront David. So he goes to confront David, and he tells David a story about a man who had a pet lamb. It was a poor man who had a pet ewe lamb. It was a little lamb, and he had like a pet like my dog Cooper. And everybody in the family loved that little lamb. They loved that lamb like they loved their brothers and sisters, and this man loved it like it was his own child. He says, and that's all he had. And there was another wealthy man who had all kinds of sheep. He had all kinds of lambs. He had more than he could deal with himself. And there was a guest who came to visit with him. And instead of taking one of his own lambs, he takes the lamb of this poor man, the only lamb that he had, and he took it and he killed it and he fed it to his guest. David was ticked when he heard this story. This man should die. This man has to be punished. And Nathan looked him square in the eye, and I can see him pointing his pointy finger right in his nose, and he says, Ish Ati, you are the man. You, and he wasn't saying it in a good way. You are the man. And David realized his sin, he was convicted in his heart, and he confessed his sin. He didn't make excuses. And a lot of people they continue to make excuses. David confessed his sin. And you know what I said earlier? If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. David received the grace of God. He received the forgiveness of God, although there were still incredibly horrible consequences for his actions. Because we suffer for our actions doesn't mean we're being punished in that sense of not being forgiven for our actions. Now a lot of people would think about that story and not really think about Nathan as being David's friend. But was Nathan David's friend that day? Yes. You better believe it. Because a friend is not only a person who will help you to laugh a little louder, smile a little bigger, but a true friend is someone who will make you, help you to live a little better. Nathan loved David enough to tell him the truth, even though he knew it could cost him himself his life, but he knew it could at least cost David, cost him David's affection and love for him. He was willing to risk David's affection and love for him by simply telling him the truth. Nathan was a good friend to David. Proverbs 18, 5 through 6 says this, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. It explains a little bit more about what that means when it says, it goes on to say, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. See, a lot of powerful people, we see this all the time, we see it in the headlines all the time, they surround themselves with a bunch of people who will do nothing but tell them what they want to hear. They'll suck up to them, they'll kiss up to them, they'll, they'll be butt kissers, if you will. Can I say that in church on something? Uh, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking And they'll just they'll try to fluff the ego. And, and there's a story, Teddy Roosevelt one time told, told the story, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, of a guy who was working for him and came to him, and he said, Teddy Roosevelt was president a long, long time ago, uh, the early 1900s, uh, around the turn of the century. He said he had the guy working for him and he came to him and the guy told him that he had stolen something for him. Well, Teddy Roosevelt said, well, you're fired. I don't want you to have anything to do with me. Because if you will steal for me, you will steal from me. He knew that character was important. He loved him enough to tell him the truth and hopefully the guy repented. But a lot of people will surround themselves with people who will do all sorts of things for them except for tell them the plain and simple truth. A person who kisses up to you all the time and flushes your ego all the time is probably not your true friend. That to tell you this? Probably not your true friend. But a person who is willing to risk your love and risk your affection for them by telling you the truth, 
That's a person who truly is your friend. A person who truly loves you. Isn't that wonderful? We don't always appreciate those kinds of people, though. But we need to. We need to be thankful for those kinds of people. And oh boy, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. Mark 10 tells us a story about a rich young man who came to Jesus and it looks like he was just seeking self-justification. He's looking to Jesus to justify himself and he tells Jesus, he says, he asks Jesus, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he tells him, he says, so I got five kids, I don't want you to pay attention to that. Let's keep on going. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, he tells him, he says, well, what about the commandments? Jesus rattles off a few commandments. He said, you kept the commandments. The guy said, oh yeah, I've done all that. Well, Jesus knows right then and there that this guy is full of it. Now, I don't have to describe to you what it is. He's full of it, okay? And Jesus knows it. And he knows that he needs to hear a word that he probably really doesn't want to hear, and Jesus gives it to him. But Mark tells us something really neat, really interesting. Mark 10, I believe it's verse 21 if you want to go back and uh, do a little study on this. Mark 10, 21, it says, Jesus looking at him and loved him. It says, Jesus looking at him and loving him said to him, there's one thing that you lack. You need to go sell all that you have and follow me. Give it to the poor and follow me. He knew that the riches was uh, uh, an idol that he had to get rid of in order to really have the eternal life that God wanted him to have. Jesus loved him. Now that word love is the word that we get our friendship, our word for friendship and love for. It's phileo, Philadelphia, brotherly love. This is the friendship kind of love that the Bible talks about. It says Jesus loved him enough to tell him what, not what he wanted to hear, but what he needed to hear. But it goes on to tell us that the man didn't respond the way he should have. Maybe he did. We pray that he did later on down the road. But it says he actually turned and walked away, saddened. And the text kind of indicates that he was also angry at what Jesus had to say. But Jesus was his friend. Jesus really loved the man the way he needed to be loved. That's what a true friend really does. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You wound a friend not in order to hurt a friend, but you may wound a friend the same way a surgeon may wound a person that's being operated on. Now, if a, a, per, a surgeon makes a wound, it's not in order to kill, it's in order to heal. A true friend may make a wound, may hurt your feelings, but there are worse things in the world. May hurt your feelings for the moment, but their intention is to heal. Now, we've got to be really careful with this, and we'll talk more about this next week and how we're to live into this in true Christian friendship, that brotherly love, that sisterly love that we're to have for one another. We've got to be careful with it because some people can use this to nitpick, to nitpick and to browbeat. And not to heal, but to kill. But to destroy. So it can be misused. And we'll see an awful example of that. And I'll tell you some stories from our own life and from examples I've heard from other people. So you can go from one extreme to the other. So we have to be careful with this. But truly, truly the faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. I can't help but think of Judas here and how Judas betrayed Jesus. Right? With the kiss. A true friend won't do that. So the thing today is not that we want to just know how to find true friends. How to discern who are our true friends. There will be plenty of things that will reveal that. But the thing I want us to get most today here is not how to find true friends, but how to be. How to be a true friend. And it ain't easy. It can get messy and it can get hard to truly be a friend to someone else. But God has called us to be friends. Jesus has called us His friend. 
God has called us friends in His covenant with Abraham. And we're to be friends with one another. In this relationship where we're closer, we're closer than even family. We're better. It's a better relationship than even family. It's a better relationship than even a marriage between a man and a woman, as David said about this love that he had for Jonathan. It was something better than that, if you can imagine. We've got an expression for that. You know, it's better than, okay? So that's the kind of love. It's something greater that Jesus Christ can allow us to live into. So not only do we want to know how to find true friends, but we want to understand how to be a true friend and have God train us and equip us through His wisdom, through His Word, and empower us by His Holy Spirit to truly be those friends that He has called us to be to each other in the body of Christ. Let us pray. Father,